Hi, and welcome to my channel. My name is Rosica, and this is The Midnight Reader. It's been a hot second. Sorry about that. I haven't made a video since, I think, February. It's been so long that the B-roll I originally shot for this video went from looking like this to looking like this. It was winter when I started these books. It is now almost summer. <laughs> A lot has happened since then. Almost finished purchasing a house, which has been a huge stressor. Multiple illnesses, stomach related, respiratory related, at least one hospitalization in there. Good news as a family, bad news as a family. Like there's been a lot going on in my life and I just haven't had time, space, energy, or bandwidth to make videos. So that's where we are. I was like, I really want to film a wrap up. I really want to show you all what I've been reading. I want to tell you a little bit about the books I've read in the last three months. However, it's 25 books at this point. So I think instead of trying to do in-depth reviews, which I definitely do not have the time, space, and energy for, I figured I would tier rank my books. So I read 25 books in the months of February, March, and April. It's currently like Saturday on April 27th. I'm definitely not going to finish anything else in the next couple of days so we're just going to call it good here. So I decided to tier rank them because I thought that would be fun and I haven't made a tier ranking video. So I've kind of separated out these books by category and then these are my tiers. For the top tier we have best friends. Like this could be a book potentially on my permanent shelf, but is hands down one of the best books I've read this year. And the next tier is Loved It. It's not my best friend forever book, but I enjoyed it a ton. I would be happy to read it again. Next tier is It Was Fine. Like this is the three to four star. It's fine. It's a book. I'm a bookworm. I like to read books. I probably won't read it again. Maybe I would recommend it to you based on whether or not you would have an interest in this book. The next category down is Should Have Just Played Stardew. The, the other thing I've been doing this entire time um, is because I don't have the bandwidth to do much of anything else. I've just been playing a lot of Stardew Valley as like my, my blood pressure re reduction and stress release. <laughs> if this book cannot beat, you know, 30 minutes of me playing Stardew, then I, I feel like it deserves to go in this category and it, it could have been left unread in my opinion. And in the last category, is I have no memory of this place, <laughs> i.e. the Gandalf category. <laughs> because there's 25 books, there's a good possibility that I'm gonna come across a book here that I don't remember anything about the plot. Um, this isn't gonna be scripted, this isn't gonna be particularly detailed, but it is gonna be a good ass time. <laughs> the first category of books that I read is cozy books. The bookish equivalent of a nice blanket and a cup of tea. The first book I read in this category is The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, and that is by Sangu Madana, I think. I can't actually see the authors because the <laughs> things are too small. This was, hands down, one of the best books I've read in a very long time. When I, I made the review for this, I said this book felt like reading The House on the Cerulean Sea for the first time for me. It was that level of like, comforting bookish hug. I'm not gonna look up all the names of the characters, but basically it follows this young woman who hilariously is a YouTuber. Okay, so you know, stars are ready. And she specializes in witchy content, but the reality is that she's actually a witch. And so that's one of the ways she gets to like, still have a little hand in the witchy world because witches aren't allowed to socialize. They're not allowed to congregate for safety reasons. Um, so she's very lonely. She lives this very lonely life. And the thing is that someone sees her YouTube video and says, you're a real witch. I can tell. And they send her an email and they say, look, we have this problem. We have three young children, all witches, and we need someone to teach them how to control their magic. And there's no adult witches around that we can find. And we think it should be you. And she thinks this is, you know, 
like a trick or a trap because she's grown up to be very paranoid. But she decides eventually to go to this house and see these three small children. They are amazing. <laughs> I love the three little girls. I love the house. I love everything about the magic in the world. And it's this lovely little, you know, found family story that also has an underlying romance. Um, and it's very modern. It's just, it's very much set in our world. And I, if you liked the house on the Cerulean Sea, I bet you would also like this book. So after reading that, I immediately reread The House uh, in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. And it's already on my permanence collection and I haven't reread it in probably like two years and it still holds up. It's still a wonderful, heartwarming read. The children are amazing. This has been a very popular booktube book, but basically it follows Linus, who's a social worker for magical children who gets tasked by his very large and definitely evil company um, <laughs> that's supposed to monitor the well-being of magical children. Uh, and he goes to this, um, it's kind of an orphanage, but really more of like a foster home. And everything about the home and the caretaker and the children peels back the dreary grayness of Linus's life and helps him discover like not only what it is to live again, but also what it is to love and have family. I cannot sing the praises enough. It's, it's such a good book. The next three books I read were books number one, two, and three in the Tea Dragon Society, um, which is a set of graphic novels which features tiny magical dragons, goes through stories of love and friendship and grief and loss. They're just hugs of graphic novels. The art is wonderful. I featured them in a vlog that I did a while back. I'll link that below if you want to hear me talk about them in more depth. I am going to put two of them in the loved it category, which is going to be book number one and book number two. Um, but I am going to put the third book in the best friends category, despite the fact that I have all three and they're obviously going to be in my permanent collection. Book number three was by far my favorite. Um, it was also kind of the saddest. It had really strong themes on grief and loss, but it was so heart-wrenchingly beautiful. And of the three, it's the one I'm looking forward most to reading again. Category two, Japanese translated books. This is actually a small category. There's only two books in here. I don't know why I made a whole category. I probably could have put these in other sections. So the first translated book I read was The Kawagama Food Detectives. Um, this book has the cutest cover of all time. Like, look at it. There's there's a freaking like cat in a bowl of noodles and it's it seems like it's gonna be a cozy grand good time. I was really hoping this would be more than it was. Basically it follows a father-daughter duo uh, living in I think Kyoto. Yes, Kyoto. Um, who run a very small restaurant and their whole thing is that people come to them and say I want you to recreate this meal and often it's something from like childhood or you know, a meal that someone who's died made, or they don't remember how it was made. Basically, they're tasked with recreating these dishes and like kind of bringing joy through food back to these people. And that sounds like on a whole, like a really fun book. It was just fine. And I'm being nice. I could have put this in should have just played Stardew. There are parts of it I enjoyed. I think my actual problem is that it's written from the wrong point of view, right? So it's written from the perspective of the daughter and father, but they never really have any character growth. It's just a series of like repeating vignettes, repeating short stories, person, problem, fix the dish, grand reveal of why the dish was perfect. But there's no character growth. Um, and I think it probably would have been a more interesting story if they had done the point of view from the characters who are seeking like, to recreate a certain meal. But yeah, there's just no character development. It just it feels really strange and repetitive, right? Um, you, there's no catharsis in the story. Also, the part that I thought was going to be the most interesting, which is where the dad goes out and does his detecting, is done entirely off page. Like, it's literally like they have their little interview and the dad's like, I'm gonna put on my hat and go running around this island and talk to this fisherman and this man's old teacher. The page turns and they're like, I'm back, it's two weeks later. <laughs> it was fine. It does have a very cute cover. Um, there is a cat in this book featured lightly, so it's not a total lie. 
there's a little bit of a cat in this book. So I was disappointed by that one, but I learned my lesson not at all, and I decided I would grab another Japanese translated fiction featuring a cat on the cover. <laughs> and that is What You Are Looking For Is In The Library. This one, however, was so much better. I'm gonna put it in the loved it category. This actually did the repeating vignettes short stories thing well. It follows these people in a, in a prefecture of Tokyo where they all for some reason or another find a reason or find themselves at a public library. Um, and they find themselves this librarian who is cartoonishly described by all of these people. Like one of them describes her as looking like Big Hero 6. Like she's a very fat, super pale woman with like a flower pin in her hair. And you don't really learn much about her, but she has this magical skill to like, you'll go and you request your books, but then she always throws in like a Phoebe and like a keychain tchotchke, all of which like kind of magically impact your life and is actually what you were looking for all along and helps you with your personal story. This works because it's written from the perspective of the person seeking out the wisdom. So it made each vignette feel very like distinct. There was also a little illustration, I think at the start of every chapter, which I really appreciated, which kind of gave you like a snapshot of each person's life. It was really fun. If you enjoy Japanese translated fiction, if you enjoy kind of cozy stories, this one is a love letter to books and libraries. And I think all the books that they talk about in here are also like they're listed in the back. So if you really wanted to read a book that was recommended, you could. I will say usually it's not because it was like a life changing story. Usually it's like it's a book about earthworms, but it like helps inspire them in some way to do the things that they want to do in their life. This was amazing. I, I really, really loved it. I, again, highly recommend if you like Japanese translated fiction. The next category is books by Ruth Ware, <laughs> of which I read three. This was part of my finishing off the Ruth Ware back, back catalog. Um, the first one I read was In a Dark Dark Wood. I'm gonna say it was fine. Like it was, it was better than I was expecting it to be. A lot of the back catalog of Ruth Ware I've heard like less than good reviews. I'm tempted to almost put it and I have no memory of this place, but I do remember the plot a little, which is that this woman goes um, out on like a hen weekend into like rural nowhere to the super modern house in the middle of nowhere. It's like a glass house with a woman that she hasn't seen since like high school. And then all this stuff starts like coming out, all these like backstabby bullshit things. Everyone's kind of miserable and then someone dies. And it's, it's good. Like I would call it a solid mid-tier Ruth Ware book. I enjoyed it more because it was better than what I was expecting for her back catalog. It was fine, it was great. I had a, a good Ruth Ware time. Next up was The Lion Game. Uh, this one was bad. <laughs> Uh, it needed editing. Um, it was it was boring for starters. It was super repetitive. The inner monologue was really annoying. <laughs> there were parts of it I enjoyed, like the main character is a new mom, which I related to, like the burdens of uh, the newborn days. She's carting this little truculent infant around on her adventures. It's It has kind of dark academia vibes. A woman, new mom, gets a text from a friend in her like boarding school years that says, I need you, you have to come. It's her like returning to meet up with those friends of old in current times, as well as the timeline going in the background to see like what they're covering up. It was too slow. And I kind of didn't feel like the crime that they covered up was that big of a deal. I, I, I don't really understand why they tried to cover it up. This plot could have been better. It was just mid. It was so thoroughly mid. At one point I did throw the book and scream at my husband because the main character was being such an annoying dumbass and making such like illogical decisions. I was just done. <laughs> so I feel like because I threw the book like it would have been better for my blood pressure had I just played Stardew. So we'll go with that. Next was Ruth Ware's current news book, which is Zero Days, and I loved it. I was not expecting to. It's very different than the rest of her books. Set in modern day, the main character, female, she's a pen tester, a penetration tester. 
So her whole thing is like she tests companies' security, like she's paid to do that uh, with her husband. He handles more of like the computer coding side and she handles the actual like jumping over like walls. They're on a job, it's going fine until she, she finishes her job, she goes home and she finds her husband dead at home in a very obvious murder. And she very quickly finds herself framed for his murder. She has to try to evade arrest while trying to find his actual killer. It's really good. Like I, I was so happy to have a female protagonist who was good at stuff, who made smart, smart choices. I, I feel like a lot of thrillers, a lot of the plot hinges on characters making dumbass decisions. Like The Lion Game was a lot of that. This one, the main plot hinged on the character making great, awesome choices where I'm like, yes, <laughs> I was so pleased you didn't take the dumb way out. <laughs> Has a little bit of like spy kind of ambiance. It was, it was just so much fun. The next category is missing women and misunderstood women. <laughs> First up is the reader. So the reason I read this is because I've been having movie nights with my husband and I had picked for the movie night Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind because I'd never seen it. And it's like, we got really like on a good conversational like kick from it. And I think we were just talking about how good of an actress Kate Winslet is. I think I said something about the reader, um, which all I knew about that movie was that I think Kate Winslet sits in a tub and she's naked <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And my husband was talking about how that was a book that he read in high school in Germany. He was talking about how he thought that was kind of interesting because it's very much about a young man's sexual awakening. And I was like, I can't really imagine reading that in high school in the US. Like hilariously, the books that I read that were considered classic novels in literature in high school, they had a lot of violence or, you know, tragedy, but they didn't re they really didn't feature sex because you know we're a puritanical nation <laughs> so I decided to read it because I, I wanted to chat about it with my husband and I'm happy I did I'm actually gonna put it in I'll put it in loved it it was a solid classic very easy to read it features the sexual awakening of a young teenage boy with a much older woman it is not a healthy relationship. There is definitely like grooming, abusive manipulation and verbal abuse that happens in that relationship. Like it is not, it is not a healthy relationship <laughs> by any means. Um, and that's the first half of the book. But the second half of the book starts when she goes missing from his life. Um, and he's always kind of trying to come to terms with like the fact that she's just gone. The second half of the book is very different. The whole timeline of this book is set in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And then he sees her again. And that's that's where the second half of the book sort of goes, is he sees her again at a trial for what she did during World War II. I'll leave it at that because I'm trying to, I don't, I really don't want to spoil much more than that. It's a really interesting read because it is about sort of two main themes. One, which is sexual awakening with like an unhealthy relationship. And two is it's about how Germany is reckoning with their morality, coming to terms with the sins of the past. Excellent classic, very easy to read, pretty short. Definitely has a lot of sex and nudity in it, so more than I ever read in high school. <laughs> Next is Where'd You Go Bernadette? Um, I read this because it was on my TBR shelf and I'm gonna level with you. I kind of wish I didn't. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in Should've Just Played Stardew. It's about a, a, a child who's very cute, who is trying to find her missing mother. And it's all about like the trials and tribulations of this like affluent Seattle neighborhood. Everyone hates this mother. They keep talking about like how she doesn't fit in, how she's so eccentric, how she's so weird. And as I'm reading her, I'm like, she's not crazy. She's just a New Yorker. <laughs> Like having lived on the East Coast, there's a very specific personality which I run into and I'm like, she's just from New York. <laughs> it's just a general, general attitude. But it just, it goes through all their struggles and all the things they're going through with the stupid private school and like mother infighting and you know, just, just, 
I just, I didn't enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with it. I just like over and over I kept being like, I don't want to read this. I'm not interested by it. It had a bit of like a campy quality to it that I found in, shoot, the book about the chemist, which I also disliked. <laughs> I'll put it up here. But it, it, it had similarities with that book. And I didn't like that one either. If maybe if you liked that one, maybe you like this one. I, it's it's about a woman who's misunderstood because of where she's from and also who she wants to be. And I just, I just didn't enjoy how it was written. I'm sorry. Next, I read the English Understand Wool. This was a short story. Um, I'm gonna put it in. It was fine. I didn't know absolutely anything going about this book going in, and I kind of feel like you shouldn't either. I thought it was fun. I thought it could have been better in places, but it was definitely worth a read, um, especially if you have any interest in the publishing industry. That's all I'm going to say about it. Next, A House in the Sky. This was also on my TBR shelf, which is why I read it. Uh, it's a memoir based on, and I'm going to call her a journalist kind of loosely, because it's not she was kind of doing journalism. <laughs> it is a woman's memoir of being held hostage in Somalia for I think over a year. It was dark. It was very dark. She got caught up in something which was way bigger than her and then she went through absolute hell. If you have interest in watching how people survive long-term isolation, um, long-term psychological and eventually physical torture like read this book <laughs> um it got very dark i was very happy when it ended it's hard to rate memoirs right i thought it was very well written i just i would never ever read this again ever and i i i wouldn't recommend this to you unless you were really interested in it it was just like i'm gonna put it in should have just played stardew because i think if i had played seven hours of Stardew versus reading this book, I think I would be a happier person. So I think I'm gonna put it in <laughs> just play Stardew. Next was A Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. This was also on my TBR shelf. I'm quite proud, I've read a lot from my TBR shelf. It's about a family in the 1970s. The father has PTSD from the Vietnam, Vietnam War. He's having difficulty with like mood regulation and controlling his violence. So they have a grand idea to move up to Alaska in supreme isolation and then they expect everything to get better and of course it really doesn't. <laughs> I would call this like a domestic family thriller romance character study. There were parts I liked. I liked the little romance storyline for the daughter as she grows up in the town. Um, I liked the sort of characters that were in the story. I liked the setting in Alaska somewhat. The, the author has clearly lived in Alaska for some time and gives these wonderful descriptions of it. At, at points it got, it got a little repetitive. Like I lived in Alaska a long time and I don't wax poetical every 30 seconds about how gorgeous it is up there. Like it, sometimes you just go to Foot Locker, you know? <laughs> I did have quibbles with it. For example, she kept using the words off the grid and it's supposed to be set in the 1970s off the grid didn't hit the nomenclature until about 1990s so it's just not not a thing and then she also just kept saying they were in the bush and she kind of puts them like just outside of homer and soldovia you're not in the bush like you're a fairy ride from homer like you're not in the bush at least not how i understand what the bush is bush is like nowhere no roads no boats like plane only this is like a 30 minute ferry ride from town i'm like mm. You're not the bush. It was fine. I actually kind of tempted to put it in I have no memory of this place because I just like don't care about it that much and I don't remember it very well and I have no interest in retaining it. Next up, An Elderly Lady is Up to No Good by Helene Turston. I think this is translated from Swedish. Um, I was expecting it to be a novel. It's actually a collection of short stories and vignettes that are published in one book. Um, it's about an old lady serial killer. That's all you need to know. It was fine. <laughs> Next category, emotional devastation. Um, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Wong. This is a novel. I thought it was a memoir for 
85% of this book, I thought it was a memoir. It's written like a memoir and it, 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 I believe is heavily inspired from the author's life. It was very poetic, like very touching, dealt with a lot of trauma. Oh my God, trigger warnings for a lot of these books, but mm, trigger warnings. I can see that this is like written beautifully. I can appreciate a lot about it. I don't think I'd read it again. Like it was just not for me personally. That doesn't mean it's not gorgeous. It doesn't mean it doesn't have absolutely beautiful and poetic prose. It it was a wonderful spotlight on an immigrant experience which I've never had. And it was it was beautiful and painful and poetic and poisonous, but I don't want to read it again. So I'm gonna put it in should have just played Stardew. <laughs> Next, they both die at the end. I'm gonna put this in it was fine. My main problem with this book, it's set in this world where it was something called Death Cast. Deathcast? Deathcast? Deathwatch. I think it's Deathcast. And you get a phone call on midnight of the day you die. So you know that you're gonna die that day. And it's always right and it's never wrong. And it follows the story of two teenage boys who sort of spend their last day on earth together. And my problem with it is that to me this very very clearly read as a dystopia. <laughs> also because there were all these causative events that kept happening. Like someone would get their death cast call and they'd be like, oh my God, I'm dying today. And then speed on their way home to try to go say goodbye to their loved ones and then crash the car. Like that's a causative event. Like if you didn't get that phone call, you wouldn't have died. So I kept being like, why, why aren't we trying to like overthrow this dystopia? But it's not that kind of book. It was just like a, a love story and a let's hang out book and a little character study. And it was fine but I really wanted them to overthrow the clear dystopia. So next, as long as the lemon trees grow, this is in the best friends category. This is one of the best books I've ever read. Literary fiction, um, it features a young woman in the middle of the Syrian war as she's trying to get her and her only surviving family member, which is her sister, out of the country. In a sort of side story, she meets the boy who she was gonna meet for potentially, you know, marriage material. And it's, devastating. It, it is it is a devastating book in every possible way. It pulled all the little pieces of my soul out and it put them all back together. The main character also has a, a huge, they're like a huge fan of Miyazaki movies. For me that was a nice communal thread because I also love uh, Miyazaki. It's really really good. I haven't read something this well written in a while. And I'm not going to tell you more about it. Just go read the damn book. Next, Between Two Kingdoms. This is a memoir. I'm going to put it in Loved It. The title is inspired by one of my favorite quotes of all time. Can I go get it? Let's see. All right, the quotes by Susan Sontag. Illness is the night sight of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use only the good passport sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. That's one of the best quotes I've ever read. Um, I originally read it in Emperor of Maladies, which is a medical history book about cancer. The title of the, of the book is based on that. As this young woman finds out that she has cancer in her early 20s, spends the bulk of her early 20s fighting it, eventually is able to achieve remission, and then is left picking up the pieces of her life and realizing that while well, she's no longer in the kingdom of the sick, she can't quite make her way back into the kingdom of the well. It's remarkably written. It's wonderful. If, you, if you've ever had to deal with like any kind of severe illness, severe isolation, um, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. I would highly recommend. The last category we've almost made it. Oh my God, such a long video. Was this shorter? I don't know. The absolute last category is comfort zone. So these are books that I read that I would just identify as being books I didn't have to stretch at all emotionally, physically, spiritually to want to read. These are books that I would just read as, you know, side munchies. First up is The Summer Job by Lizzie Dent. This was on my TBR shelf. It is a rom-com about a woman who uh, is sort of like floundering in her own life and when her roommate decides to ditch a job as a wine sommelier in the Scottish Highlands at the last moment, she decides to go impersonate her and pretend to be a sommelier. <laughs> um, and she was originally 
expecting it to be like a sort of easy uh, bartending job at a low, low stakes joint. It turns out that the place they hi that hired her friend is actually getting into like the boutique restaurant business and they need a sommelier who really knows her shit, which she does not. She does not. She knows literally nothing about food and literally nothing about alcohol. She's a Pillsbury dum-dum, but it is a fun story. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in, it was fine. It was a solid little rom-com, I enjoyed it. Next, uh, Cozy Mystery, Glory B. Um, I am always a fan of a mystery that has an older female protagonist. <laughs> a, a grandma level uh, woman in the deep south um, attempts to solve the murder of her best friend, who is a nun. As the police stated, it was a suicide. Um, she takes things into her own hands. I really enjoyed it. I would, I would, I would put up there and loved it. It was really good. And I also love reading cozy mysteries with non-white protagonists. I would definitely read the second one in this series, so. Next was The Farmer's Wife. This is a memoir. I'm gonna put it in, it was fine. I originally found this woman through Instagram. I follow her husband's farm account. I think he's called The Hardy Shepherd. I started following that Instagram account during COVID as a way to transport myself somewhere nicer. Um, and this is the story of her life in a rural farming community in England? England or Scotland? I want to say England. It's quite possibly not. Somewhere in the UK. <laughs> it has a framing problem, which is that it's framed around one day, like the hours of the day and her present and then she relates it to the past. I It didn't work for me as a narrative device. I got very confused about where we were in her life because um, you, you, you bop around a lot. I wasn't clear when we were like in the present, so I was just a little confused. It's a love letter to to domesticity and also how it's much harder than it looks um, as well as as motherhood and how motherhood is also much harder than it looks. I'm putting it in it was fine category but I would actually really recommend this book to my mom. Uh, mom I think you would like this one. Next um, was Bride by Allie Hazelwood and I loved it. <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> Ellie Hazelwood is known for writing her STEM romance novels. This is not that. She's written like so many of this of very much the same. This is a werewolf vampire love story and it's raunchy as hell. <laughs> but whenever I read Smut, often I am upset by how bad the writing is and how bad the characters are developed. This is well written. It's funny and I had a great time. Very fun smut. Absolutely would recommend. It made me want to love Twilight and that takes a lot. <laughs> and last on my list, yay! Book 25 is Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. Um, I'm gonna put this in Loved It and I'm shocked. I have never read a Neil Gaiman book that I've loved, ever. I liked Coraline. I thought Stardust was okay. I love the movie, thought the book was okay. Really didn't like The Ocean at the End of the Lane. And I read this because it was on my shelf. It was on my TBR shelf. I picked it up at a little library somewhere and I thought today's the day. I am delighted. Like it was so fun. It's, it's a fantasy set in modern London and it features London above and London below. And it's basically, there's this hidden world in like the London subway and underground. I, I really loved it. I thought it was, it was fun. It was funny. It was entertaining. I had a great time with it. And I would, I would totally read it again. I'm, I'm gonna read American Gods based on a recommendation from my friend Kristen because I finally found a, a Neil Gaiman book I like. So I guess I can finally give his, his writing more of a try because I haven't been motivated to do before. And that's it. That's my, my tier ranking of all 25 books I read in the last three months. I am sure my videos will be sporadic for the present future because I am working on moving across a whole ass country, buying a house, um, dealing with family stuff, and I'm just 
I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'll try to make videos here and there because I do love my channel. Um, please be kind because like this is this is all the effort I can give you, okay? <laughs> um, but I, I found some good reads here and let me know if you've read any of these books, if you had differing opinions than me. I, I was I was pretty pleased. It's been a good reading, a couple of good reading months, which has been great because it's been a stressful time. <laughs> I will see you all next video. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Please like and subscribe because it helps my little channel and I will see you all hopefully soon.